Disclaimer, please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk, then play at half speed. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the fourth leg of the intramural sports type podcast tournament. And what a pleasant day it is for some tennis. I am here with the challenger team from Sweden, Vikan Intesvenska. Gentlemen. Tennis. A pleasure. Now, gentlemen, I have been informed that you are a golf podcast and not a tennis podcast. Is that correct? Tennis. Yeah, we are the golfing podcast. We like to play the golf on the green with the 18 holes and lots of land in Sweden. <laughs> Come on, interview guy, why you no laugh? It's funny joke. <laughs> we are golfing podcast that does not know how to play this tennis. But you know it could be worse. We could be a movie podcast. Oh, <laughs> that, that is indeed a rather funny little jab. <laughs> now, I am told that your opponents are also not a tennis playing podcast. Do you feel that this will impact or change at all your playing style and or strategy? I am so agreed. Uh, we know very little about the tennis, but we are looking forward to a fun game with our American friends. Hopefully we can learn lots of each other. Very sporting. Now, it seems we have the chaps from the Fire Pit Podcast with us now. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Is this, is this, thing, is this thing on? Are, are we good? Can you hear me? Can, can you, can you, can you, yes, 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 yes. You might want to just a little bit back, a little bit. Cool. There, there we go. Fantastic. And so we have here with us the Fire Pit Podcast. They are a movie-watching podcast who's had an unprecedented winning streak coming to this round of the tournament. So, gentlemen, how do you... <laughs> That's right, Gene. You're looking at the all-time greatest. The players with the layers, the bros with the hose, and the faces that run the places. The Fire Pit Podcast is here to give final thoughts on those pansies from golf time in the fjords. An interesting energy you bring, gentlemen. Now, Dan, your team has never played tennis before either. How do you feel about your odds going into this round? Never played tennis before. We never boxed before either. Beat them. We never played football before. Beat them. Never played baseball before. Beat them. We won all of those. It doesn't matter. You line them up for us, and we just keep knocking them right down. Yeah, we're going right down on them. All the way. Balls deep. I, uh, uh, oh. yeah, okay. Yeah. Josh, Josh, uh-huh. Josh, come yeah. here. Yeah, okay. Seriously, we talked about this. You yeah, suck at yeah. the smack talk. Leave it to me and Tom. Okay. okay. Yeah, I know, but you know. I, I know. No, no, no. Hype man. We talked about this. Okay. Sorry. All I'm saying is that when you get Dan, Josh, and Tom on that court, the only thing that's for certain is that nothing is for certain. Yeah. I mean, come on, Gene. It's like ping pong with grass. It's outlaw mud show shit where you're fighting over a hot dog. Golf's not a real sport. Tennis isn't a real sport. We're not a real sport. Now, to you, Tom. The rules are very clear that there can only be two of you on the court, yet you are a three-man podcast. So have you determined your roles on the court? We're all in on this role-playing, Gary. We're dressed up, dolled up, and ready to play. I love the energy, but stop. You're bad at this. Just, you know, stick to being the quiet hype man. It's okay. Just stick to being the quiet hype man. Yeah, I'm good. Are you fine? Okay, thanks. <clears throat> it doesn't matter who's on the court, Gene. What matters is who's walking up the podcast champions. And brother, you're looking at them. Three time, three time, three time winners. Yeah. I think we're all excited to see your game tonight. I'm only going to see two things tonight. Me hitting them and them hitting the court. Yeah, they see opportunity. All I see are fatalities. Yeah. Very splendid, gentlemen. So, to you, Josh, do you have any final words for the people at home? And I'm all out of bubble gum. Oh, oh God. Oh, for uh, fuck's sake. Jesus. Oh, God, no. Um, yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. First base, 
base, we have Gene Joe Jones in the greatest. Second base, we have Robert Duvall in the natural. Third base, Robert Brusky in Rudy. Your shortstop, John Favreau in Wimbledon. Your catcher, Paul Bettany in A Knight's Tale. And finally, the pitcher, Alan Tudyk in 42. Lead the fire pit into its next journey of the second season, striking out the competition and sliding into home with the classic Chadwick Boseman film about the legendary Jackie Robinson himself, 42! It's curveballs and clinch plays every Tuesday here at the fire pit. Play it all! Good evening, boxing listeners, and welcome back to the Fire Pit. I'm Dan, the angry one, Nigel, and we are still striking out towards 42. After being carried off the field in victorious fashion, we're grabbing some strawberries and cream and heading out to our next film. As per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from the last film and moved them onto this one. Now to give us an idea of what we're watching and who we're watching, I'll tag in Tom. Oh, yeah, brother. Thank you, Nigel. I'm Tom, the editor Thompson, and last week we watched Robert Prosky give some life advice and encouragement to Sean Astin in 1993's Rudy. Someone else encouraging Rudy along with his dream was John Favreau, whom we'll watch tonight in 2004's Wimbledon, the first rom com. On the fire pit. I don't know if that's something to be praised or something to be dreaded. But that's something, yeah. Anywho, to give us a bit more of the rundown of the film and how the box office looked back in 2004, I now tag Josh into the match. Give me the baton. Go get him, brother. It. Get it. I'm running with the baton. Wait. That's, that, just yeah. keep going. Just, just, just okay. Just. Thanks. Do your thing. Th- th- He's th- trying his best. Thanks, yeah. Tom. I'm Josh, the wrong one, Reginald here. And as mentioned tonight, we're watching the 2004 romantic comedy Wimbledon, starring one Jean Favreau. And let's all be honest, we all know him from his role on Friends. It also yes. stars Paul Bettany, Kristen Stewart, and also a reunion of the MCU, pre-MCU. <laughs> Neat. So Wimbledon was really Wimbledon, not Wimbledon, as I've been corrected about six times so far. Really leaning into this wrong one, Bill. Yeah, we know that's it. why wow. your nickname changed. <laughs> <laughs> so Wimbledon was uh, released in the United States on 17 September 2004, and in the UK on 24 September 2004. Has a running time of 98 minutes and a budget of about 31 million, and a box office return of 41 million. Has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 61 percent. And an IMDb score of 6.3 out of 10. Ouch. Ouch. That's that's pretty pretty low. What was the Rotten Tomato again? 61%? 61%. Uh, Is that both audience and critics? Because that's not the lowest numbers we've had. No, but they're pretty rough. Yeah. Oh, boy. There we go. So Wimbledon had a 57% audience score and a 61% tomato meter. 57% audience score. 57% audience. Um, Yeah, it doesn't look like it was well-received. I mean, technically, anything over 60% in Rotten Tomatoes is considered fresh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but fresh doesn't mean good. It does not. So it never scored number one in the box office. It's opening weekend. It premiered at number four. But uh, out of the top five, there was three new releases on the uh, in the box office. You guys care to take a whack at what movie uh, premiered that weekend? September of two thousand four. Yep, uh, it's it's an obscure one. I've only seen the movie once. It was different. Uh, huh. I really, I I'm drawing a blank. Uh, two thousand four. I want to say Shaun of the Dead, but that was October, and I don't even think I think that was two thousand six. So w- surprise me, Josh. Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow. Oh, God. Fuck! It, so it was the same weekend as um, Shaun of the Dead, because I saw both of those films. And Okay, I'm stepping back. I really hate uh, Sky Captain and the World of, the, of Tomorrow. Carry on, sorry. Yeah, that, there's uh, a movie I'm not in a hurry to get to. All right, mm-hmm. Well, uh, Tom, care to take a whack at the number two movie that weekend? Shaun of the Dead? Mr. 3000. Wow, wait, what? Yeah, wait. a baseball film. 
The Bernie Mac movie? Yes. That movie? Yes. Number two? Pulled in $8.6 million. Coming in at number three on its second week of release was Resident Evil Apocalypse. No! Yes. And then at number four, tonight's film, Wimbledon, pulling in $7.1 million. The entire box office took a giant shit in the bed. (laughs) Yes. September 2004. What's a rough month? There is <laughs> not a lot. There's a lot of familiar movies in the box office. Like um, Which Resident Evil was it again? Apocalypse. Was that the second, third, or twelfth one? <laughs> it was before they got into double digits. It, I think it I believe Armageddon is the third one. I don't care. But number so Apocalypse. Yeah, number five in the box office was Cellular. I don't remember that one. It sounds familiar. Was that like one of the fifty Colin Farrell movies that came out in the early double lots? So, oh yeah, that's right. Because it was, I think it was the guy stuck in a, um, um, a phone booth with a cell phone. No, that was. I don't think that was cellular. Was that cellular? Or was that? Uh... I, I am. Oh, this was a Jason cover. Statham film. Okay, I'm looking up cellular. Okay, no, this is. Um, I think it's a Jason Statham. Film. 2000. Chris Ev- yeah, Chris Evans, Jason Statham. Young man receives an emergency phone call on his cell phone from an older woman. Woman seems to have been kidnapped, and people are targeting her husband. Okay, I vaguely remember this film. Yeah, it was in that. I think that was one of those ones because that went the movie with Colin Farrell and Keith uh, Kiefer Sutherland. That was a. Uh... Was that just phone booth? Yes. That was a yes, bo- short but interesting film. I don't know if I like it or not. It's been so long since I've seen it. But uh, other notables in the box office was um, Without a Paddle, which was an interesting uh, road movie. Remember that one, Dan? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I know that one. I know that one. Jet Li Hero, Napoleon Dynamite at number eight on its 15th week of release. One of my uh, recent watches, but I thought it was an absolutely amazing film, was Tom Cruise's Collateral. Was at number nine on its seventh week of release. And guys, this next film at number 10, you're going to be amazed that it's at number 10 on its sixth week of release. And only, it didn't even pull in $2 million because it's such an amazing film. The Princess Diaries 2 Royal Engagement. I think I would have rather gone to see Resident Evil. <laughs> I honestly thought that film was a direct-to-DVD. Wow. <laughs> Apparently not. But uh, Born Supremacy at number 11. Anaconda's The Hunt for the Blood Orchard at number 12. Zach Braff's Garden State at 13. Manchurian Candidate at number 18. I, Robot at 19. Super Babies, Baby Geniuses 2 at number 20, Ooh. pulling in $531,000. Spider-Man 2 was still in the theaters. So was Alien vs. Predator. The Village, Harry Potter, and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Okay. Yeah, there was a lot of movies. Dodgeball was on its 14th week of release. Mm. Okay, that but that was before the, the tragedy of September 2004. Oh, oh my God. Wow. This is the... Ex- remember, I think... It, I can't remember what movie it was that we did a couple weeks back. A couple weeks before. Yeah. No, that was... Uh, the natural the natural when we were doing the natural and you were like listing all the movies that were in the box office that weekend and then like that's that's one where you walk in the movie theater and you're like man what do i go see today i don't know what it's, what to see today you have choices this one yeah. you walk in and you're like i'm you gonna find out. something else to do today <laughs> than go to the movies is there you walk in and then you walk out <laughs> it's like i wonder what's on tv <laughs> what are they going to come up with netflix what are they going to invent netflix <laughs> No, this is the weekend that Netflix was originally conceived. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's this is a this is a rough weekend. This is like the exact opposite of that weekend with the natural. Seriously, yes. dear Ugh. God! Yeah, because on uh, its final week, it ran up until the weekend of October twenty second to twenty fourth. So it didn't even have a month in the box office, or just barely over a month. But the movie that was at number one that was released that weekend was The Grudge on October 22nd, 2004. It's last weekend. Okay, The Grudge I, yeah. I liked. The Grudge was all right. Shaun of the Dead was number 15 that weekend on its fifth week of release. Okay. And, Tom, you'll be happy to know that on this part- on its final weekend of release, Shaun of the Dead pulled in more money than Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow, which was at number 16. That does that does make me happy. That does make me smile. Thank you, Josh. But Napoleon Dynamite beat both of them. Well, I've never seen all of Napoleon Dynamite, so... Uh... You've seen the clips online, so you've seen the movie. Yeah, okay. I don't know. If we ever do that movie, I've got thoughts on that one. <laughs> we all do. Yeah. You know what I'm curious about, though, Dan? What's that? 
your trivia on this movie. Okay, well, trying to find trivia about this and not the actual Wimbledon tennis tournament was a treat. Um, there's not a lot on this film. Uh, apparently, this was a very quiet production. Uh, not a lot of drama and not a lot of fighting, not a lot of um, small or big ego, small name actors doing this and the other, which tends to lean towards being kind of a boring kind of a trivia section but one notable piece of trivia for this is this film stars a lot of people who were coming from superhero movies or would later go do superhero movies um in this movie there's the the two lead actors are paul bettany and kirsten dunst paul bettany audiences now know him as vision in the avengers films and the mcu he was also the voice of jarvis in the first two iron man movies um no i'm sorry he's jarvis in three of the iron man movies or yeah when does he stop being Jarvis? Was it um, Avengers Age, Age of, of Age of Ultron? Okay. Age of Ultron, yep. Okay. So yeah, so he's Jarvis in the first three Iron Man movies and the two of the Avengers movies. And then he goes and he's the voice and the appearance of Vision uh in the MCU. Like I said, Kirsten Dunst was Mary Jane Watson in the Sam Raimi Spider Man trilogy. Mm-hmm. James McAvoy plays Paul Bettany's brother in this film. Uh he's Professor X in the alternate timeline X Men movies or the X Men movies that take place before the well, Deadpool said it best. The timelines are getting confusing. So, but <laughs> McAvoy is one of the Professor X's. He's young Professor X. Oh, and John Favreau's in this movie. Uh, we but we mentioned him last week. He's also he obviously has directed a couple of films, produced a couple of films in the MCU. He's also Happy Hogan in the Iron Man, Avenger, and Spider Man movies. And I think that's it. There's also. Um, Jamie Lannister is in this movie. Obviously, went on to do uh, Game of Thrones, and uh, we loved him. For how many seasons was there? We loved him for six years. Yes. And uh, there's another guy on here. I didn't catch his name. Maybe Tom's got it, but he ends up being in The Walking Dead. Oh, um, no, I don't actually have that. Oh. Okay. Um, but yeah, this this no nothing kind of film that was in the one of the worst weekends I can ever hear about in the box office start a lot of people who went on to go do the MCU. <laughs> Especially, I would say, John Favreau would be one of the founding fathers of the MCU, you would say. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a big daddy. He is, if without yeah. him, there would be no MCU. Yeah, yeah, without Iron Man, there really is no MCU. So, John um, Favreau, hero. Responsible for such uh, amazing films like Elf, um, Iron Man 1 and 2, TV shows like The Mandalorian, but also, also known for the amazing remake of The Lion King that is a live action, but also CG and terrible. <laughs> to That's animated. right. He did do that. Well, and uh, he, did the, he did the Jungle Book, too. And the Jungle Book was incredibly mediocre. So I think that John Favreau is an amazing director, and I think he's a great actor. But I think some of his directorial choices are not choice. Well, you know, he, he does those so he can pay for the production costs on his show about him running a food truck. So... It pays the bills. It's one of those things, you know, it's like if the mouse is throwing money at you, I would direct a movie for the mouse for whatever amount of money they want to give. Yeah, I mean, I'd I'd, throw myself out for that. We would win some that's like as long as there's a steady paycheck, we'll direct whatever you want us to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Disney. Hint, hint. Guys, want to hear any more trivia? I got only a little bit. I don't have much, but fire away. All right. This one actually made sense to me after I saw the trailer for this film. The lead role that Paul Bettany plays in the movie was originally written and intended for Hugh Grant. And that makes so much sense after seeing the the trailer for this film, because this feels like a Hugh Grant movie. Mm -hmm. This really does feel like, oh, okay, I've seen this before because it's every Hugh Grant movie. But I just thought when I saw the trailer for this film and when Tom mentioned it way back in the selection section episode, I was like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this makes sense that this was written for Hugh Grant. This feels like a Hugh Grant film. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, uh, this is the only movie to ever be filmed at the actual Wimbledon tournament. Uh, scenes were, for the movie were filmed during the Wimbledon tournament of 2003. The actors would walk onto the court at the beginning or the end of a match as though they were really competing. The officials and spectators were actual tennis officials and spectators. They were not extras or actors. This is the only time in the history of the tournament that this has been allowed. Normally, like this tournament is for tennis fans, of which if after you've heard our intro or a cold open, you'll know that we're not tennis fans because we didn't know anything about the game. But uh, for tennis fans, Wimbledon's like the big tournament. That's their Super Bowl. It's their Masters tournament. It's their World Series. Like Wimbledon's the big one. Mm-hmm. And there's very strict rules in Wimbledon. Like all the competitors have to wear white from head to toe. 
Um, they're not allowed to wear any other color. Even their sweatbands, their socks. You can't even have different color shoelaces on your tennis shoes. Everything has to be white. It's competed on grass. It's a grass uh, field. Mm-hmm. The strawberries and cream is a very big like dish that's served all Wimbledon. That's you see people eating it, and the reason why people eat strawberries and cream is because it's quiet. Oh, yeah. hence the strawberries and cream early in the uh, yeah, spurt yeah, of this. Eat, oh, yeah, uh, they eat strawberries and cream because it's quiet. So no uh, Doritos and popcorn. I've never watched it. I'll be honest. I've never watched a single match on Wimbledon. I just researching this movie found a few things out about it but i'm not saying they don't serve popcorn or anything else at the tournament it's in england so i don't know but the strawberries and cream is for two reasons one it's quiet and two it's kind of a posh kind of a thing it used to um tennis uh especially early 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 in the day tennis was a rich man's sport or a rich person's sport and strawberries and cream used to be very posh kind of foods it wasn't a food that a commoner could afford to eat so rich people went to see tennis tournaments and stuff like that that's where the strawberries and cream comes from hmm. capital that's again fairly arbitrary but again tradition yeah but that's pretty much all i got on here i mean i didn't i didn't find a whole lot just mostly about the actual tennis tournament itself there's not really a lot to this film it just they they filmed on a couple of courts that don't exist anymore they were taken down mm-hmm. um that's oh, pretty, oh and uh, reese witherspoon was supposed to be uh in the kirsten dunce role but she turned it down at the last minute so they cast kirsten dunce oh, not a bad i mean lateral move i mean she's she's an award winner too so i yeah. would pick her and she's cute she's what you want in a romantic lead yes oh very good i have learned a bit about this film that i had never had any interest in watching same here it's like, it, but also it's about this movie it's like all this trivia it's like i learned something new that i was interested but i would never have learned otherwise so thank you dan yes. thank you what about you tom welcome to wimbledon tagline she's the golden girl he's a long shot it's a match made in dot 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 I'm assuming the dot 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 to infer it's Wimbledon. Summary, a pro tennis player has lost his ambition. Fortunately for him, he meets a young player on the women's circuit who helps him recapture his focus for Wimbledon. Um, This is a unique film. This I think this is one of the first ones on this journey that's not based on any novel or true story or short story or anything like that. The broad strokes of this, I mean, there's nothing really terrible uh, about this there are like five producers tim bevan liza chasen eric fellner deborah hayward mary richardson all of them have been too broad a range of hit and misses to really judge their quality though almost all of them have backed les miserables love actually and the bridget jones's diary uh, with the exception of mary richardson who did back band of brothers so it's not like we can say this is going to be quality because they've also backed some duds the writers there were three of them adam brooks jennifer flackett ampersand mark levin adam brooks um i think he wrote this story first almost all romantic comedies french kiss and practical magic jennifer and mark they really had nothing else in terms of romantic comedies or such like that uh, both worked on TV series before this, Earth 2 and the movie Madeline. They've also done Journey to the Center of the Earth and currently work on Big Mouth on the Netflix series. I'm assuming that Brooks wrote it first and then these other two came in to doll it up. Uh, so I don't know how to feel about that. The director, Richard Loncrane, no rom-coms under his belt. The closest thing I can find to like comedy was a movie called the missionary starring michael palin the rest would be or just dramas none of which i'd recognize and nigel kind of already talked about the cast of this we've got a few returning favorites like you said john favreau we all know him from mcu he plays ron roth he was the friend character sam neill plays dennis bradbury who we know from this podcast from Dead Calm and Hunt for Red October. He plays Kirsten Dunst's dad here. We know he's a solid actor. Both of them are solid. And, you know, for the main characters, Paul Bettany and Kirsten Dunst, great stuff, both of them. And Dan's already mentioned the rest of the cast. So if you're a comic book geek, you're going to like seeing James McAvoy with Happy Hogan and Vision, uh, but not much else for this. 
there's no drama, there's no inspiration. It's not like I really want to make this film. And there's no awards. How do you even get Razzies? No, I think it's just like your standard. We need a rom com to fill this season, so let's make a rom com. Regarding your box office, Josh, and how low that was, I have a hypothesis. Um, but I'm going to get into that with my uh, expectations. But I'm that's kind of all there is for this film. So, Nigel, with all that we know and don't know, what are your ex- expectations about this film going? Oh, through? so low. <laughs> <laughs> and no, 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 no that's not, a Star not, Wars story. Yeah, that's a Star Wars film that that also isn't very good. Um, no, uh, I do remember when this movie came out, and my initial thought was, I'm so glad that I'm not dating anybody that's going to drag me to go see this. Like. Thank God. But uh, and now I'm not dating you guys, but I got dragged to go see it. It just took a few years. <laughs> <laughs> Get to see in the end. Yeah. You're seeing but, Tom um, and he's going to see take you to see this movie because he had yeah. to see yeah. it. But uh, no, my expectations are pretty low. I don't think I'm going to enjoy this film. I'm not the biggest fan of romantic comedies. There's a few that I like, but that's also because they tend to transcend being a romantic comedy. Um, and I'm pretty sure this one's not going to, especially when I've read that it was originally written for Hugh Grant. And I'm like, I've watched every Hugh Grant film. And says the guy who hates like, romantic comedies. Well, I've dated and I've watched them. I don't like them. But um, fair point. I haven't watched every Hugh Grant film, but I've, I've seen like, you know, four weddings and a funeral and all that. And I'm like, OK, this movie feels like it's going to be four weddings and a funeral, except tennis. I'm just, I don't know. I'm just not looking forward to it. Um, I know Paul Bettany's a good actor. And Kirsten Dunst's actually a good actress. And John Favreau and James McAvoy. It's like, they're good actors. And I'm just not the biggest fan of romantic comedies. I'm not looking forward to this film. And I think I'm going to hate it. So my expectations are pretty, pretty low. Um, and that's pretty much all I've got. Uh, what about you, Tom? Uh, I'm cynical about this film. This whole thing smells of cash grab. The fact that they picked Paul Bettany, who at this point just really didn't have anything for him. He was just like a audible grab. There, I looked this up uh, in the background. I was trying to get meta. There are so many tax abatements and tax bonuses that you get from filming in Great Britain. So I'm looking at Paul Bettany. He was like, why pick him? Because he's so cheap that the British government will pay you his salary to film in Great Britain. Same with so many of these. So uh, this is going to be a bullshit film by the numbers. Just uh, disgusting. If I was looking to get laid in 2004 and i was dating a basic girl this would be perfect but since i'm not um i've got some scotch on the side so i'm gonna make the most of this night josh what about you um i have no expectations of this film (laughs) i look at this film the same way you would look at a room and think it would look amazing in beige (laughs) Or I, I expect to enjoy this film as I would a four-hour drive through Kansas. <laughs> now you're just so, getting mean, Josh. I am just, I'm not expecting much out of this. I think it's going to be a sightseeing tour. Like, oh, look, it's Professor X. And, oh, look, it's Vision. And, oh, look, it's this guy. and Because that's rom-coms in the early double aughts was, let's get all these big-name actors and have them be in the show for about 37 seconds. So mm-hmm. we can put them on the poster. And they all agreed because they needed a paycheck so they could yeah. uh, buy a new Subaru. Yeah. Yes. Because let's be honest, it's Australian for beer. But the... <laughs> Wait, um... What? That? What? Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> the, the joke only works if you don't overthink it. <laughs> Oh, God. Wow, we are... This is, I think this is the most cynical all of us have ever gone into a film. Like, I don't... Like, I, I don't know. It might end up being an okay film. We watched The Natural, and we all came out with that one with a negative overall review, but we still thought the movie had its good elements. We just felt the story was weak. Like, Slipstream is another perfect example. We got out of that movie, and we're like, I didn't hate it. So, I'm honestly... I'm not expecting to, like, loathe this movie. Because have been having been married for going on sixteen years, I have had to watch my fair share of rom com. Yeah, same here. 
So um, it's one of those things. It's an acquired taste if it's shoved down your throat for over a day. <laughs> it just feels like this is a paint by numbers rom com. Like the ones that I enjoy do something a little bit different or, you know, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Like I don't mind the rom coms that have kind of a like a supernatural element or just some kind of a gimmick. Like uh, what was it? The John Cusack one, Serendipity. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he's uh they put the number in a book and he finds it eventually, like ten yeah. years later. Yeah. Like I, I like it was some of the serendipitous moments. They really played into the title. And I remember laughing and thinking, oh my God, when I was watching that film. Granted, I'm not ever going to like pick it up and watch it again unless my wife's like, we're going to watch this movie tonight. So if I come out of this movie and I find it mediocre, I'll be fine with that. If I like the movie to the point where it's like, yeah, that was a good movie. I'll never watch it again. That would be a high expectation. But yeah. Oof. It's going to be interesting. It will. Oof. So, Tom, we've already got two bad movies in this or one bad movie in this uh, journey. Technically, two, if you count the natural. So we'll see how if you're going to bat a thousand or not. But you were saying? Uh... No, I'd say, I'd say you want to know what else is interesting? What's no. Okay, never mind then. <laughs> no, but, but you what know what's interesting? interesting? What's that, Josh? <laughs> Tom, play the music. <laughs> I'll have what she's having. Wow, we're all learning the title of the wrong ones tonight. But Tom. Uh, what, what? Josh. But Tom. Yes, we're, just, we're stepping all over each other. I'm going to shut up now. Tom, go. All right. So I've got some reviews here. It's the quiz section of the podcast. I found several reviews, some thoughts that other people on the internet have on this movie. One through ten stars. I will give you each uh, the review or the title of the review. And you have to guess whether one through ten uh, stars it was given. Person who gets closest without going over wins a point. Whoever gets on gets two points. And since Josh made a big deal about not ever getting to get picked first, I'm going to go with Dan. Yay. To nobody's surprise. <laughs> Shouldn't have made a deal about it, Josh. Squeaky wheel sometimes just gets replaced. Keep that in mind. So, Nigel, are you ready to rock? Uh, Sure. Awesome. Okay, so this first review comes from Prismark 10. The title of the title of the review is New Balls, please. I'm going to say 4 out of 10. Reginald? That's just the title. Does it have any punctuation? No punctuation. Just well, comma between balls and please. 5 out of 10. Josh, off to a strong start. That is a five-star review. Ooh, booyah. I figured you guys would go lower on that guess. Okay, well, Josh, this one goes to you. This one comes from Oliver T, who says, This film makes Jackass look like Shakespeare. Three out of ten. Nigel? One. And Dan ties it up. That was a one-star review. Oh, this is going to be interesting already. Hey, we're oh. volleying back and forth. <laughs> like Pong. Volleyball. Yes. <laughs> good, call, good call on the nickname change. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. So, jo uh, Nigel, the next question is to you. This is question number three. Um, this one comes from Summer G521, who says, Wimbledon is one of those movies where if you like impractical plots and happy endings, or if you're just a tennis fan, it's right up your alley. I give this movie a rating of three out of five stars. What? <laughs> Do you need me to repeat it? He, he, he said three. Out of five stars. And we're saying out of ten. Yes. I, I'm going to say still three. Reginald? Uh, I'm going to go eight out of ten. Dan is closest. This is a four-star review. <laughs> <laughs> this is stupid. He's no longer allowed to do trivia, even when he wins. <laughs> yeah. We'll just skip that week and just flip a coin. <laughs> Who's doing trivia? No, but just it'll be a previously recorded trivia segment that from a different movie. Yeah, it'll be this one. <laughs> to remind everybody why Tom's not allowed to do trivia. I I thought that question was funny. I thought that it, was. It, was. it was. it was. It was good. 
<laughs> All right, so for the fourth question, I believe it goes to Josh. Um, this one comes from Prylands, who says, This is not so much a straight-to-DVD film <laughs> as it is a straight-in-the-bin film. Wow. Two out of ten. All right, Joe. Three out of ten. Josh is on the money. That was a two-star. So Josh is up by nice. one point. And this is the final question. So, Nigel... This, this review comes from Flagrant Baronessa, who says, From the people that brought you Notting Hill comes another romantic comedy almost exactly like it. <laughs> it's funny because um, Paul Bettany's home in this movie is the same home they used in Notting Hill. <laughs> Found that out when I was looking up trivia. Oh, no shit. Uh, I'm going to say... Can you read it one more time for me? From the people that brought you Notting Hill comes another romantic comedy almost exactly like it. Four out of ten. Reginald? Mm. Five out of ten. And Josh gets the quiz. That is a six-star review. Wow. Well, okay. At least I didn't get shut out. That's all that matters. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was a good game, though. That was good. There were no ten-star reviews here. And I'll give <laughs> you guys the bonus question that I have. I think, uh, Josh, will start with you. This one comes from Mitiori who says, slow. Five out of ten. <laughs> Nigel? Three. Oh, Josh would have got that one. That's a seven star. Wow. <laughs> yes. I almost said one, but then I was like, no. He says it's slow. He doesn't say it's bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think the highest one I saw was like a nine star review, and the title was just a smiley face. <laughs> yeah, not, not a lot of love for this film. At which bodes- I'm going to do my quiz next week. It's going to be all emoji based. <laughs> Guys, I can't record next week. I can't record next week. <laughs> you know, it's it's a damn shame that we don't do a uh, animated films. I would love to watch the emoji movie with you guys. But you know what else I'd love to watch? What's that, Josh? Well, I would love to watch Tom play the music. Welcome back to another overhead smashing episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and line judge, Tom. And unless they extended the sidelines to the end of the bleachers, I'd say that last shot was just a bit out of bounds. Also, could we have someone call that poor child an ambulance? But thank you for staying in bounds with us here at The Fire Pit. The fire pit strikes out into the ready position, aiming to see their way to Chadwick Boseman in the Destination Film 42. It's still anyone's game as the team faces down Vision and Mary Jane, but they're looking to make this a golden set. But enough setup from me. What say we look and see how the team is faring in their tournament? Ah, gentlemen, so what are we watching tonight? It's the latest round of the intramural podcast sports type tournament. It's Sven and Flynn from the Swedish team going against Dan, Josh, and Tom from the Fire Pit podcast. They're playing tennis this round. Ah, fascinating. I've never seen this tennis before. Mind if I join you fellows? Oh, well, certainly. So, would you mind explaining to me what's happening now? Uh, well, right now, it's just gentle volleying. Both teams testing each other out, that sort of thing. Oh, and a point for the Swedish team. Good show. Good show. Good show. Come on, ref, are you blind? I mean, come on, that was clearly out. What match are you watching up there? Come on! Get off your phone, ref. I say this is indeed an unusual turn. I've never seen a team dispute a point so adamantly. Especially when the ball clearly hit right in the middle of their own court. I really don't like how that Josh fellow is using his momentary distraction to sneak upon the other side of the field and cut a hole in that one Sven's racket. A bold strategy indeed, but will it pay off. Indeed it does. Josh's serve went right through his racket. And he seems to be none the wiser. And how it happened. Oh my goodness. Wait, what's happening now? Well, they're switching sides, you see. This way, one side does not have to play in the sun the whole time. So now the Swedish team will have to contend with the sunshine. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Skiff, but is it legal for the Tom fellow to be hitting the ball back? into court before it goes out of bounds? Well, I, 
I don't think there are any rules specifically against it. Oh, no. Oh, actually, it does. Ooh, it appears the referee does think poorly of it. So do they get the point, then? Oh, uh, not unless you count a tongue lashing as points. Look, if I have one more of these from you, you're disqualified! Kiss my ass! Yeah. 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 Suck it! Oh, Fish yeah. and biscuits! So why is it, you suppose, that the Swedish team does not engage in similar antics? Certainly this would even the playing field. It's not about winning, but how you look afterwards. Right, right. And the way the fire pit is digging into the mud, they might as well be the heels of a boot. So they are trying to save face, then? Lest they be mistaken for heels. Uh, jolly good, jolly good. Now, that was a legitimate point for the Swedish team, so it is currently 15 love, Piffle. Well, if that is the situation, then why is the referee not marking the points? Th that's because Tom is distracting the ref and keeping him from seeing it. How rude. But technically not illegal. Ah, but I see that Flynn is now working to get the ref's attention. I imagine now that order will soon be restored. Oh, oh my. my! Josh is grabbing Flynn by the head and seems to be choking him on the net now. That does not seem like very sportsmanlike conduct. Oh, certainly not, but it is effective in allowing Dan to take out Sven with the flying clothesline <laughs> before he can step in. This is indeed turning into a real slobberknocker. Is this common in tennis? Uh, no, this is definitely a novel strategy, Piffle. As is his trying to shove tennis balls down Sven's throat. And yet still, the referee is distracted. How is it that nobody in the audience is alerting him of these shenanigans? <laughs> Tennis crowds can't make noise during a match, that would be rude. Ah, certainly. Ah, at last. The other Flynn fellow seems to have seized Josh's own tennis racket and... <laughs> ...taken him out with a mighty blow. Yes, it seems the Swedish team is now regaining the upper hand. Jolly good. And am I to assume that he is going to immediately alert the referee of these ongoings? No, it appears he is going to pull Dan off of Sven and... Yes, I do believe that it was a DDT right onto his own tennis racket. Oh, most excellent execution. Now, why is this Flynn fellow now cupping his hand to his ear? He's signaling to the crowd that he's now preparing to lay the smacketh down on his patented finisher. A maneuver so powerful it can incapacitate a man instantaneously. Wait one moment. It appears that somebody is running in from the audience. Yes, I do believe that. Yes, it is wrestling legend Jim Cornette with his trademark tennis racket in hand and... Oh, oh yes! He just my. laid out Flynn with a blow to the back of the head from out of nowhere! I suspect that this was quite orchestrated. It does appear that way. The, the referee is finally forcing Tom back to his sideline, so there is a chance that they will be caught red-handed. No, no, Skiff. Jim is already dissipating back into the crowd, and the fire pit has returned to their side. There will be no comic retribution this day. And since both members of the Swedish team are now down, he has to award the win to the fire pit. What a sneaky and underhanded way to obtain victory. Is it always like this? No, they usually reserve this sort of thing for the Australian Open. Well... Jolly good show, then. I must join you guys again. Jolly good. Yeah, jolly good. Jolly good. Yes. Good form. Jolly good. Propensity. Propensity. Wow. If this is how they play tennis, I'd hate to go up against them in badminton. Mm-hmm. But if you want to play against us in a game of get your ad on the show, or if you want to serve us some of your thoughts on this or past episodes, or if you want an excuse to abuse some tennis slang without anyone seeing, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put fire pit in the subject line as well as why you're emailing, whether it's for an ad, a recommendation, a movie correction, a thought about a thought we had, or anything else like that, and just lob it our way. From there, we'll read it, line up our serve, give it a Hail Mary slam shot, and watch it bounce high out of bounds and into the bleachers, and never respond. I mean, there's just no way they're unlodging that thing from that guy's eye. I mean, wow, is it ever in there. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. And that's game. You have officially ran out of audience members to knock unconscious. Splendid. I have to go deal with the legal paperwork of all of these concussion lawsuits. I'll let you get back to the episode.
Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. <laughs> Dan thought it couldn't be an essay. <laughs> No, I just keep typing, backing, backspacing, and retyping, backspacing, but my font keeps getting bigger. Fuck this movie. This movie is already very pretentious. It's tennis in England. Oh, uh, something I forgot to read in my trivia section. Um, it was really hard to get actors to convincingly play tennis like professionals, so they just had them doing the moves, and most of the time the ball was CGI put in there. You're shitting me. No, because it was really hard to get them to hit the ball, like volley, like professional tennis players. So they just had them doing the moves and then they added the ball in post. That's like several million dollars. They couldn't just have people throw the ball off screen and just hit? Apparently not. You're probably wondering how I got here. No, we're not. You guys can <laughs> you know, talk down to me all you want, you little bastards, but which one of you is going to be in the fucking MCU in 10 years? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Posh British bastards. Is Kirsten Dunst going to be in there? It's going to be a a sexy mix up. Please tell me there's going to be a sexy mix up with Kirsten Dunst. Oh, Tom, you were right. Here's the sexy mix up. Yep. Hold on. Who's uh who's doing um romantic comedy bingo? You can tell he's rich because he could get a beer out of the mini bar. Oh my god! Well, I know she could do better than this. He can too. Well, he's actually, I think he's trying oh, a little bit. I don't think bit. Bob Petney is that, I think Bob Petney is at least trying to turn in a B paper. <laughs> like, she's like, I have an A in the class already. I don't care what I get on this one. I'm, so she just wrote fuck and you on two pages for the two page paper. I'm already locked into Spider-Man 3. I'm making that money. It's fine. Oh, yeah. This movie was definitely written for Hugh Grant. <laughs> that was definitely like, oh, Hugh Grant, awkward before, during, and after sex. Yeah, that's a that's a trope. Okay. Yeah, Paul Bettany's way too sexy to pull that off. Yeah. Yeah. Paul Bettany would walk into there, and he'd be like, you want to fuck? And then she would already be on the bed with her legs spread. <laughs> Sorry, Paul, you're too sexy to pull that off. <laughs> I'm not gay, I promise. <laughs> Okay, a little gay. <laughs> my marriage is a sham. <laughs> my, my wife's a beard. <laughs> and first class and women fawning over me and uh, endorsement mm. deals and being ri- It's so hard being rich and oh, it's beautiful. So, it's so terrible being rich. He's like, this is my second child because my first one went through the windshield of my car. <laughs> For those listening, that's a dead calm callback. It is. The one good part about dead calm. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, oh crazy driving scene. Hold on. No, no. Yep. Yeah, if you're playing bingo. But I'm banging vision. It's cool. He's going to bang a, a Olsen sister later on. <laughs> but not one of the crazy ones. <laughs> not, not the one that kills Heath Ledger. That's next week's movie. <laughs> I hate her in this movie. I hate this movie. That's just blank. Of that. I hate everything in this movie. I would have preferred to watch a white screen for an hour and a half. <laughs> How much longer do we have this? Oh my God. We almost have. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh my God. We're only 43 minutes in. <laughs> I'm hungry and I want to eat. Why does your back hurt? John Favreau's one carrying this movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she uh she came and went. But um clever girl. We're <laughs> We're already better writers than the people who wrote this. See he needs a racket that he made after lightning struck his childhood tree. Wrong movie. They need him to chant his name so he can finally play after years of struggle. Also the wrong movie. You're thinking of better sports movies than this one. I don't believe you two are actually in love. I believe you are two actors in a movie. It's still a better love story than Twilight. Not by much. Real drama is if this was the Australian Open, and they kept flashing the temperature gauge. 105 <laughs> degrees. 
107 degrees. It's over. It's blissfully over on the long misery. Dedicated to Mark McCormick. Nineteen. Well, Mark McCormick. If I was Mark McCormick's estate, I would sue if this movie was dedicated to <laughs> Why are all the bad films dedicated to people? This is the epilogue to our tale of sadness. She was what? forced to watch it by her royal dadness. Tom. Nigel. I say this in the most endearing way, but you are no longer allowed to pick lists. And now, back to the episode. Yes, that was that movie was rough. Oh wow! <laughs> oh, oh god, gentlemen! On behalf of the Fire Pit Podcast and to the viewers out there, I want to what? formally apologize. Hey, for the film we had we, to watch. we said yeah, we said going forward with this podcast, we don't want to do just good movies. We don't want to do just bad movies. We just want to do movies, and this one was a bad one. Would it even count as a movie? Because seriously. It was just a series of train wrecks cobbled together. Oh, hey. All right, so that was Wimbledon. Oh, boy, was that Wimbledon. Uh, we got some things to unpack here. Um, we're going to go through our final thoughts now, and we are going to start with Josh, who was very vocal of how much he loved this film. I can't wait to hear it. Josh? Okay, so Wimbledon. The director didn't know how to direct, and the actors somehow managed... To forget their craft. There was few exceptions. And of those exceptions, they were broken down into moments. Because even John Favreau in scenes was like, dude, you were in friends. Act better. <laughs> <laughs> like, seriously, this, this like I get what they were trying to go for, and I can see that this film would look good on paper. Like a guy meeting a girl and it drives him to go from being one of the worst ranked players at this tournament to winning it. You know, um, it's <laughs> their love that pushed him type thing. I could see the soggy mess that they wanted us to lick up, but at the same time, the execution was incredibly poor. Like remember back in the natural, how we talked about how everything encompassing that movie was great, except the story. Yeah. Like, I can see the story they wanted in this one. It's just everything surrounding the story was shit. I'm dogging on the actors and actresses in this film, but they phoned it in. I know that these people are capable of much better performances, but they definitely phoned it in. And some of the direction was just lazy, too. Like that scene where he punched the dude at the Eye of London, it was cut into three takes. And it's just like that looked lazy. Um, I will give it this. The last 10 minutes of the movie was good. When he was trying to play um, the other character and he was trying to win the tournament, that was engaging. But it's literally everything leading up to that was not engaging. I felt no sympathy, no empathy, no interest in their relationship at all through the entirety of this film. And then the epilogue was like, okay, they're in New York and have babies now. I ha don't care. But I can see the story that they wanted to tell. That's about it. But that's all I've really got. Um, I will chime in later on. Thompson, how about you? I am offended by this film. Oh, God, this dead calm levels here i'm insulted even and i will tell you why because britain loves when hollywood makes films there and around the time this film was made london itself rewarded productions by refunding between 20 to 25 percent of the money spent on everything this includes costumes catering and cg to that point they would also refund with grants and such, up to $300,000 per writer, director, actor for everything they did. So we're talking about a film whose lead was Paul Bettany, who I guarantee you did not make over $300,000, as well as every other British actor, cast member, so on, so forth, with the exception of the two, maybe three, American actors they didn't have to pay a goddamned dime for anyone who worked on this film. So I'm not only pissed off that this thing made more money than it actually probably did on paper. They didn't spend practically anything to make this two-dimensional paint-by-numbers phoned-in insult. Of a film. My God. Did anyone care. 
in this movie. Jesus God. What frustrates me more, and I, I'm going to build on what you said, Josh, there were options. There, there, were, there was potential here in the story. You had McAvoy's character who was gambling, and the fact that he always bet against his brother. Where was there not a scene where like a reporter picked up on that? It's like, scandal? Brother purposefully throwing matches so other brother can bet on him? Was there anything with the family, the family estate being in trouble because of the gambling? There could have been so much realistic drama. He hurt his hand trying to sneak in to see Mary Jane. There could have been something with that, too. Or they could have subverted expectations. Like, in the end, he fails or he, like, bows out and supports Mary Jane's character. Just there. You could have done something like that. But no, this was just your standard October, November, September. We need a romantic comedy here because we need a romantic comedy film. The only good thing about this film was they they knew for the matches in the end when to be quiet, which built the tension. But the rest, I don't even think anyone who made this film ever watched tennis. I'm hesitant to show this to anyone who is a tennis fan, but I want to because I want to hear them bitch about this. Much like any film about firefighters, I love hearing my dad and his friends, you know, pick those apart as firefighters. But Nigel, what are your thoughts? I hate this movie. (laughs) Summing it up for everyone. I, you know what? My expectations were like bottom of the barrel for this film. And my God, did it meet. Um, actually it exceeded my expectations. This is an insult to things that are at the bottoms of barrels. Uh, (laughs) This movie was so lazy. Romantic comedies are one supposed to be romantic and two supposed to be comedies. This movie was neither one of those things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It had a few chuckle worthy scenes, but nothing I would say stood out. And I'll probably forget the jokes before I go to bed tonight. And the romance did not feel earned in any way, shape or form. It was really weird, especially when she loses and turns against him. Like, you're the one that wanted to be fuck buddies. You know, like, it's you're the one who wanted this. Not, you know, well, I'm not saying Paul Bettany didn't want it, but like, this was her <laughs> idea. The whole yeah. thing was her idea. And so and then that just kind of, to me, came out of left field when she kind of like turns against him like that. I didn't like that at all. The dialogue, it wasn't even typical cringe worthy romantic comedy dialogue where you, you know, it's like people don't talk like that. This was just cringe worthy bad writing dialogue, not even the romantic dialogue. It's like all of it was really bad. But I'm going to have to echo some of Josh's statements when we were doing the watch. Uh, Kirsten Dunst, I have seen her in a lot of different films, including other romantic comedies. She's a much better actress than this. She's so bad in this movie. It's unreal. She's just wooden and uninteresting. Mm-hmm. And just, I don't see how Paul Bettany's character is falling in love with her. And they don't show any love scenes in this movie. There's no sex scenes or no really lovey dovey romance scenes, with the exception of the scene where they're walking around the city mm-hmm. af- after that party and the uh, London Eye. And then when they they go to his flat for a day or two, but like for the most part, they don't like they never really show him hooking up. Mm-hmm. And they only kiss a handful of times in the film. Like the romance doesn't feel like it's there. It's like the whole idea of them falling in love and becoming this couple and be in and, and doing all that is all happening off screen. The audience isn't seeing any of this. So as they transform into this quote unquote strong couple that truly loves each other deeply, you're not seeing it. Like there's no mm-hmm. way to get behind the romance of the story. I mean, imagine if you watched a James Bond film. And James Bond goes into a room and there's a bunch of bad guys. And then it cuts to another scene and it's James Bond walking out of the warehouse and all the bad guys are dead. And then, but everyone talks about how great of a secret agent or how great of a super spy James Bond is, but they never show you why James Bond is so good at his job. Mm -hmm. That's how this movie feels to me. It just feels like it's unearned because they're not showing it. And the biggest sin in movies is show don't tell. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't tell me that they're this great couple or that they're this strong, loving couple that's falling deeply in love with each other over the course of this tennis match without showing me how they're doing it. Mm-hmm. And they don't. So you could say that Jamie Lannister and his sister had more chemistry. They did. I'm not <laughs> lying. They I, did. I, I was going to say Sandra Bullock and Keanu Reeves and Speed had more yeah. chemistry. It's like, like I said, I've seen... 
Kirsten Dunst in other films, like, you know, when she's in the Raimi Spider-Man movies, they show her and Peter falling in love. They don't just tell you that, oh, yeah, they're falling in love, which is what this movie does. This movie says, no, trust us, they're a couple. Well, I don't, I can't tell how. Yeah, she bangs him and then she's in love with him. Yeah, or, and then he's in love with her. Like, okay, I I mean, fine, but they, there's no lovey-dovey scenes. I'm not even saying it had to have a bunch of sex scenes in it for me to believe that they're falling in love. No, but maybe a couple of uh, more scenes of them together in bed talking talk, or chatting, you know, after sex. That's a trope in romantic comedies is post coitus scenes. So, mm-hmm. you know, you don't have to have a bunch of sex scenes. I don't need that, but you could have had a couple scenes of them in bed talking, falling in love, t- you know, ch- chatting. Yeah, all the scenes yeah. that they were after at post coital in bed, it's like he's leaving, she's getting up or whatever. Yeah, like like a good example is the very first time she brings up the whole idea of how do you feel about fooling around before a match? And he's all like, well, I haven't done enough research to know if it's a good thing or not, but I'm, I'm curious about the research. And she goes, I'll bet you are. And then it cuts to the night, like because that, that scene was in during the day. And then it cuts to the night of them on the balcony of that hotel room talking. And it's implied that they've had sex. However, they're fully dressed and they're just chatting like they've been carrying on that whole conversation all afternoon. You have no idea that they actually had sex if unless they have to come right out and tell you, oh, yeah, they, they banged at some point in time in the afternoon. And to, to support that, too, I need a real conversation that I had was her just patting him on the head and say, you can do it, buddy. You still got what it takes to win Wimbledon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Go it's for it. Like I said, there's just no scenes of them falling in love, or at least nothing realistic. And you can't do that if the, that's the base of your story, whether it's a super spy movie or a war movie or a romantic movie like this is supposed to be or a superhero film. I mean, you can't just tell the audience no they're a great couple and that's that was what really bothered me about the storytelling in this is that the couple in this film just it's so wooden i haven't seen this kind of wooden acting in a quote-unquote romantic setting since twilight like just two leads that have no chemistry whatsoever and just i can't believe that this is them falling in love and kirsten dunce is a much better actress than this oh yeah she wasn't convincing at all even in the first half like what was we 40 minutes in and we're like oh my god well, I think it comes down to directing. Uh, we joked while we were watching, you know, your one and done director. Maybe he was. Maybe he was just like, that's good. It's like, are you sure? Are you sure that was like, that was the rehearsal take? You were recording through that? Like, yeah, let's move on. Really? That's what it felt like. Yeah. Yeah. Like no coverage, no real anything behind that. Yeah. Oh, and that. Ooh, the denouement at the end, like the whole like, and now we live in Brooklyn. Like, we yeah, well, it's definitely implied they moved back to America, where um, whatever city she's from. But like I said, the epilogue would have been fine if the romance in the movie had been more realistically portrayed. Yeah, and the fact that they were like what seemed like the not best part of New York City implied that they lost their fortunes. Was there a storyline where like his family was going to go bankrupt and her dad was going to disown her if they got together? Yeah. So Nigel, no, I, I agree with you in every point you're making here, both you and Josh for the listeners out there. If you want to watch a good tennis movie, watch match point. At least there you get Scarlett Johansson trying. Eh, this film was just bollocks. Yeah, I agree. And, and just, <laughs> they told us at the beginning of the film, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god he did warn us yes oh, oh man would you even watch this as a tried to get laid film no no it better be mind-blowing sex i'm just saying she better be hot and yeah. worth ruining my marriage yeah then, get on top and spin and i'll we'll, we'll talk like if you're if she's hot enough to where i'm willing to ruin my marriage for her and she's like this is my absolute favorite film i have to watch this movie before doing it then no definitely not i would say fuck you this show sucks yeah and if it's a test if you can get through this movie i'll we'll have sex uh, i'm out not worth it what ruining your marriage yeah not oh, worth it no, no. Watching no. This movie. yeah i'm not doing it no. So single use back in 2004, horny and fresh in college, you still wouldn't. Fuck no. If I've never seen the movie before, maybe. Yeah, if I okay, if I hadn't seen it before, but no, I'm not. But yeah, I've already blew my this load was... all over you guys, so it's not going to happen. Yeah, this movie was terrible. I, this movie was just awful. Yeah. Do you guys feel this is the worst film we've seen so far? I mean, the, in the entire span of this podcast? It's up there with me. 
with Pathfinder where there's very few redeeming qualities that I can really latch on to. Like, and even Pathfinder, I, I always joke and we, we became a running gag that it's, it's got good cinematography and it's, it's a beautifully shot film. But other than that, it's awful. This movie, I don't know. I'm having a hard time finding anything to hang my hat on. Even the, even the natural, which I turned against, was like, well, the performances were pretty good in the natural, and the music was pretty good, and I did like the the period setting. That was neat. This movie, I'm not finding anything. Josh, what about you? Um, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Um, I don't know. Like, if I was to rank this in terms of bad films, of all the worst films we've seen, like Pathfinder, know, it's like, Swashbuckler. Swing dead vote, com, swing dead vote. Com. I would definitely put it in the swing vote dead com category. The greatest. The greatest is definitely worse than this. Yeah, the greatest is worse than this, but this is just a bad film all around. Yeah. It's just bad. I can't find anything. I'm really just like, even the parts I, that I, I did enjoy. Oh, go ahead, Josh. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I can see enough through the shit of this film that I can see how somebody could enjoy it, though. Like, I can legitimately see how somebody could enjoy this film. I wouldn't understand it, but I can mm-hmm. see how th- that they could, do. They could, you know? Well, I'm, I'm of the opinion this is one of the worst films we've seen just because with all the talent behind it, at least in acting-wise, and the fact that they just didn't use any of it, abuse, they didn't even show up to class. They I would watch this before watching The Shootist again. <laughs> That's for your mom, Tom. <laughs> That's what... You said <laughs> I would probably bar. watch this before watching the original True Grit again. Oh that no, I'd you, watch Dan. I would definitely watch both of those films. Yeah, I would watch True film. Grit again before this for sure. I, yeah. I just this movie to me was just terrible all around. Yeah. Just, True Grit had parts of it I liked. I can hang my you know hang on the some of the performances or something in True Grit. Even the parts I did kind of enjoy, like I thought. John Favreau wasn't bad and James McAvoy wasn't bad, but I wouldn't tell somebody who's even a big diehard fan of those particular actors. You need to go and check out Wimbledon just for their scenes alone. No, James yeah. McAvoy's in better movies. John Favreau's in better movies. If you want to go watch their performances, go watch those movies. Yeah. The only good thing that we got out of this was that uh, Paul Bettany became vision. That's yeah. the only good thing that came out of this. Yeah. I would say that James McAvoy put in a better performance in Deadpool too. Yes. He was in that for five seconds. That's the joke. <laughs> I don't even think he was in five seconds. He closed the door, and that was still better acting than this entire film. But I've hit all my notes, guys. I'm just going to continue to get more yeah. and more pissed we're de- off. We're definitely circling the drain in terms of thoughts here. Oh, my God. Don't watch this movie, not even if you want to get laid. Uh, and well, you know what, if that's it, this movie sucks and we're heading out the gate on this one. So that does it for tonight's show. Um, as a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are sold or downloaded. Our regular episodes are Tuesdays at six. Please like, and subscribe, whatever medium you choose. We really appreciate it. It helps us out. Also, uh, if uh, you listen to the podcast, whether you listen to it once or regularly, please leave a review. It helps us uh, grow. It helps us uh, get linked to searches in uh, mediums, especially if you're a movie fan and, and you like to listen to different movie podcasts, you'll find us on the search. So thank you. And be sure to join us on Discord channel as well. The link in the episode description can be found at discord.me slash firepit. There you'll get notifications, new episodes, And even better, get to discuss with other fans of the podcast about some of the episodes we've made and some of the movies we've seen. You can join them in agreeing with us about this movie, uh, that it was an absolute waste of an hour and a half. You could have done better hitting your head against the wall. And it's a fun time on the Discord channel, not this movie. So join them. And uh, if you want to leave us a nice short Kurt message, hit us up on Twitter at fire pit cce um that's our twitter handle so we'll accept anything up to 160 characters that's that's the twitter limit right guys i don't tweet the tweets yes um, it's about tw- yeah but um but if you want to send us something a little bit longer and a little bit more in depth and a little bit more hate filled that you couldn't get out in 160 characters or less uh feel free to shoot us an email at curtain call inc at gmail.com um 
we'll happily accept it. We'll happily read it or do whatever the guy at the interspersal said he'll do. My own correction. It's curtain call entertainment. I N C at gmail.com. Capital C. Capital C. Curtain call entertainment. I N C at gmail.com. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs> We don't copy and paste this from the previous week's episode. <laughs> professional podcasters, professional podcasters, ladies and gentlemen. So, Nigel, any shout outs while uh, Josh is throwing all of us under the bus? Yeah, I got two special shout outs this week. Uh, one, I'll, I'll shout out Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Uh, always appreciate her listening to us, giving me the feedback and all that. And two, anyone who's listened to our podcast knows that we're all three diehard astronauts fans fans of space travel and nasa and all that so uh shout out to the late michael collins and his estate and his family what a legend uh i didn't know this until earlier this week when he passed away that while they were on their way to the moon neil armstrong was trying to discuss what would be the first word spoken when he gets on the moon and michael collins says if you had any balls you would say Wait, what's that? And then scream and then cut off your microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so. Neil Armstrong apparently has no balls. Yeah, apparently he didn't listen to that advice. But yeah, Michael Collins told him, if you have any balls, you'll say, wait, what's that? And then you'll scream and then cut your microphone off for 20 minutes. <laughs> so. But yeah, we're we're all diehard astronaut fans, and I was really sad to hear him passing, mostly because now it means two thirds of the first men who went to the moon are gone. Yeah. So and I uh Michael Collins is my son's namesake, so it was definitely hard for me. Yeah, shout out to Michael Collins and his family. Thoughts are with you. Like I said, we're huge astronaut fans, huge NASA fans, so shout out to him tonight. A major salute to you, sir. Oh, shit, now I gotta follow that up. Oh my god. Um, so I've got two Facebook followers following up Michael Collins, Takera and Spiteri. Thank you for following us on Facebook. You two of many hundreds who are there to just kind of lend your moral support uh, and ear a mouth to spread the word about us. Uh, thank you very much. Also want to just kind of give a nice little, um, Thank you very much to Zencaster, as always, for helping to record this podcast, keep things succinct, make sure we do not drop any recordings. You have been a steady supporter for us in this, and you've been free, which is great. We get some of the best recording from you. You're not paying us to laud you, give your praise, but that you do such a good job. We we can't say enough about you. So, Takara... Spiteri and Zencaster, thank you for helping to keep these fire pits burning. And I actually have a shout out tonight that isn't you guys or my mom. My buddy Draken from uh, my Swoga days at Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes, the same game that uh, our friends at the Shattered Order podcast play. He recently started listening to our episode and he gave me a lot of his thoughts on it. So I appreciate the feedback and thank you for listening. And also, yeah, I, I was happy to hear uh, what he gave me. Uh, he wrote me a book. I'm trying to find a quote that he said, but uh, he definitely was a gave some constructive criticism as well as some uh, praise. So was he the guy from Rudy who told Rudy he would never make it? Or was he the guy from Rudy he, who said, go for it? Yes. Awesome. That's what I thought. <laughs> so that's been this episode. So where are we going to next, T? What's, what are we galloping towards for our next movie? Well, we're up for some badass 80s music in a 1400 setting. Uh, oh. It's jousting, Josh. So it'd be like the 900s. So, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know history well, so. <laughs> Josh doesn't know history before the Wright brothers discovered how to fly. He's an yeah. expert on that stuff, but when it comes to anything that happens before If you flight. need help on orbital mechanics, I'm good. But if you need me to tell you what year they invented rice, I am at a loss. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, there was jousting in Game of Thrones too before it sucked. Yes, but unfortunately not. <laughs> we watched Jamie Lannister tonight. We, we did. did. And he was one of the better parts of this film. So kudos to you, um, Jamie Lannister. But we're unfortunately, up here, Tom, we're closing up. Don't don't talk about the movie. Um, no, I'm done. I was going to say we're going to follow Paul Bettany into the night. You tale. got just a really sh shitty uh, 
armor there, man. You just let me tear you down pretty quick. Looks like you need to have a hot chick make you some awesome armor. A Night's Tale is the next movie we're going to watch, is what we're trying to say. This movie sucked. Hopefully, A Night's Tale, no. a Night's Tale will be better. Yeah, A Night's Tale should be better. Actually, I, it's been a while since I've seen that movie, but I do remember liking it. Um, even though it's about as, well, it's not historically accurate at all. Oh, uh, God, no. <laughs> no, it's not historically accurate. But until next week, I've been Dan. I've been Tom. And I've been Josh. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Stay safe out there. So that was the tennis round of the intramural podcast sports type tournament. Inta Infa Svenska. How do you feel about your loss to the fire pit? Uh, we are so excited to have learned so much from our American friends. We never knew that tennis was such an exciting sport. We look forward to meeting them again on our field sometimes. It'll be good time. Oh, well, very sportsman of you. Thank you. And to the fire pit, how do you feel after your win by disqualification? I'm telling you, it's a tragedy, Gene. We won by DQ, but the real DQ is them. I DQ them. I DQ them forever. Forever, I say. Yeah, and I like ice cream, too, from Dairy Queen. It's awesome when it's dipped in chocolate. Guys, they are de- de- cute. Wait, Josh, th- that doesn't make sense, buddy. Here's your racket, fellas. Ah! Ew! Oh. Ah. God damn it. God damn it. You know what else doesn't make sense? Tennis. I told you it wasn't a real sport. I told you it was all rigged against us. Ow. Wait, but Dan, we won. I want to take pictures of my Subaru after a rain. It's so shiny. Oh, God. Thank you. I, never mind. I got to call the hospital and tell them that we're coming. Just do you, what's what's Britain's number for 911? Well, I guess this was tennis. Thank you all for joining. And as always. Subaru! Oh, dear.